Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome. Uh, today we are going to learn about uh, an interesting imaging modality and that is called as uh, ultrasound imaging. Now, you might be quite uh, aware like some of you might be aware of it and might have heard about this particular name called as ultrasound and uh, obviously, it creates quite a buzz in everybody's uh, mind as to what is this uh, small uh, prefix of ultra doing along with sound over there. Now, uh, to give you a very simple hint over here, it is something to do with the frequency in which we are uh, going to work out over here and all comes down from the point that these frequencies are above our uh, standard audible limit. So, human ears can hear up to 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz basically. So, if you are above that particular frequency, then you are in something called as an ultrasound limit as per uh, uh, our, our standard uh, parlance. Now, how uh, we are going to cover down is something on this sort that initially I would be speaking about acoustic uh, wave propagation in media and from there I would be moving on to how waves are reflected and so this part is just a very basic refresher of some of the concepts you had done in your uh, high school level physics as well. But uh, again coming down from the perspective of how we are going to use all of these wave propagation and everything in order to create an image of uh, our own internal body or what is called as the soft tissue and soft tissue made up organs. So, after reflection of waves uh, I would be speaking about the interference principle between waves and uh, which actually helps us in creating a very practical application which is called as beam forming in ultrasound. Now, uh, often if you go through literatures you would be coming down uh, through these terms which called as ultrasound beam. Now, in general uh, when we will be going through this uh, uh, physics part of it you would see that uh, this is since this is some sort of a mechanical wave. So, they always emit in terms of waveforms and these uh, these wave fronts are uh, always spherical in nature. So, they are not necessarily something which will follow one single packet as in for uh, laser lights where you can always have a beam. So, but there is a analogy which we draw over there and then use some very tricky physics and instrumentation uh, combination together in order to get ourselves something which we call as a beam. So, from there uh, after we understand the basics of these instrumentation I would be coming down into what an ultrasound imaging instrumentation is and what are the different uh, blocks which make up a very standard ultrasound system which is used. Uh, so, this this uh, standard ultrasound system design which we are going to read over here is not limited to only medical applications. So, they can have meteorological applications as well they can have uh, ground penetrating surveillance applications they can have. Uh, um, applications in mines and multiple numerous uh, ways in which ultrasound imaging is used other than medical as well. Now, from there I would enter into some specific properties of sound waves and speed of sound in different uh, common materials and media and uh, from there we will be coming into something called as uh, pulse propagation losses in uh, due inside a media or what is called as a lossy media and what happens to the pulse and the total energy which an ultrasound wave carries and from there I would enter into some clinically used frequencies and what are the different ways in which clinically uses of ultrasound are and some uh, photographs and some, some uh, basic uh, refresher on what an ultrasound machine uh, looks like. So, with that let us start with it now initially say you have this sort of a problem. So, let us consider a surface um, and, and this can be a natural surface. So, you do not need to have a very flat planar surface in any way you can have some sort of a curved surface over there. Now, for ultrasound you will have a transducer which will be placed on the surface and uh, for all practical purposes this transducer has to be placed in exact contact with the surface you cannot have an air gap or anything. So, you have to place the transducer actually on the surface itself that is why if you are going down for an ultrasound imaging of some sort to a diagnostic center you would see that they would uh, take the probe apply some jelly and then place it directly on contact of your surface because that is the way how the whole imaging has to work and we will come down to 
uh, eventually down the slides uh, we will come down to the rationale as to why you need to put it close to the surface and if you are not putting it exactly on the surface then what is the disadvantage uh, for this kind of an imaging. Now say this is this transducer is placed over there and now it emits a small uh, uh, vibration a small small beat pulse uh, say there is there is one one acoustic pulse which is emitted from there. Now what it is going to do is uh, going to be something like this. So, if you look at the principal uh, wave front over there, so after a particular gap of time which uh, you would see this is where the principal wave front is located. Now that is going to propagate down the line over here. Now you would see that uh, there is a change in color which we have on the wave fronts over there and these wave fronts are basically uh, all the locations which are in the same phase at a particular uh, given point of time. Okay. So, we are basically probing after a fixed period of interval over there and just drawing down the contour of all the points on that wave which are in the same phase over there. Okay. So, now for all practical purposes we will assume that this is the point where uh, the amplitude of the wave is maximum after a given time interval over there and that is how it is going. So, imagine you throwing a stone in a pond of water or in a small bucket of water and then you would see a uh, circular wave front which is just propagating along over there. So, imagine a similar kind of thing happening and that is what happens with an ultrasound within your body as well. Okay. Now, from there you would see that initially they would be spherical and now as the radius of this sphere keeps on increasing. So, your spherical surface now starts becoming a planar surface given a small interval you are looking at it. That is why say our earth is something like a sphere which is an oblate spheroid as such. Now, on this if you are looking at a small portion of land then it would always appear as flat. We are not able to see the curvature of the earth in any way. So, over here also it is the same thing as the wave front keeps on going bigger and bigger and uh, you would see that eventually with increase in radius your wave front appears as if planar. Now, this is a beauty which ultrasound provides and is actually necessary for the kind of imaging which we are going to do over here. So, what we call this initial part near the transducer is called as the Fresnel zone or the near zone and this is where you have the spherical wave front still pre present over there and this is not something a zone which is good for imaging. So, we never do an imaging classically in the Fresnel zone. Now, the other zone where you have all of these flattened out uh, wave fronts is called as the Fraunhofer zone or the far field and typically this is the zone which is very much preferred in order to do an imaging and we will come down eventually as to why it is, but just make these concepts clear. The near zone is called as the Fresnel zone and the far zone is called as the Fraunhofer zone over there and the far zone you will always have a planar wave form. Now, uh, since in ultrasound the idea is that you have a pulse which is propagating through media, it strikes a particular body and comes back. Okay. So, when it comes back you can gauge basically if you know the sound uh, the speed of sound in that particular media. So, you just need to look into the time it has taken to come back and from that you can estimate at what distance was that particular object which it was striking and which was echoing back over here. So, that is how we use this whole concept for imaging. So, over here imagine that this is there is a point in media this point which is supposed to be the first obstruction from where the wave will get reflected. Okay. So, in that case what happens is that the forward wave would be traveling and eventually it will strike that particular media and from there you will have a reverse traveling wave. Okay. And if, if, if you have more than uh, one point say there is another reflector over here, there is another one over here, you would see multiple of those reflections coming back, but they will come down after a different period of time. right? So, this is one concept which will happen over here, which is the main way of how you are going to do this whole of imaging. Okay. Now, from there let us look into another interesting phenomena which is called as interference between waves and this is where um, we are going to enter into what an imaging with ultrasound is. Because till now if you had seen you had one transducer and it was sending out waves, it was striking somewhere and coming back. Okay. So, you basically had uh, no control over where that point was located except for the depth from the transducer you did not have control over where in uh, like orthogonal to that particular line is the point located. So, on the 2D space you can never figure out you just have a 1D way of figuring out where that obstruction is located. Okay. So, this wave interference is something which helps us in solving that problem as well. 
So what happens over here is we do not have uh, one transducer anymore. So now it is say multiple number of transducers. So let us start with just two transducers and see how this interference happens and eventually uh, we will extrapolate this whole uh, methodology to multiple number of transducers over there. Now say if there are two transducers and both of them are fired at the same time. So basically the same wave pulse would be emitting together from both of them and it would be traveling down the line. Okay. So if both of them are fired together you would see that this is this solid one is the wave front for transducer 1, the dotted line is the wave front for transducer 2 and somewhere over here they would uh, be intersecting each other as well and that is the point where they will there would be heavy amount of constructive interference between these two wave fronts because both the wave fronts are in the same phase. Okay. Although they are coming from two different sources, but since they are on the same phase, so there will be uh, uh, constructive interference between these two wave fronts. Now, when there is constructive interference, you have a summation of amplitude. So, the power of the signal, which is square of the amplitude, is obviously much higher than anywhere else over there. So, all of these regions will have a much lower power of this acoustic pressure wave than the point where which is marked by cross over here. Okay. Now, as this propagates and in the second wave front, so once this completes one time cycle and goes to the next time cycle, over there also again it will be interfering with each other. Okay. So, you will have this point which has the highest magnitude. Now, over time it will keep on interfering with each other and this is how these interference points will be defined. Now, if you look clearly at the total acoustic pressure which is present across over here or the total acoustic power which is present in this media is maximally concentrated along these points which are marked by a cross right that is already established to us in a good way. Now the point is if this is uh, as such going to be the maximally um, so a point where, where you have maximum energy concentration. So this packs the whole thing into some sort of a beam because a beam is basically defined by where you have maximum energy concentration of whatever energy you are going to carry down over there. So that defines this whole thing as a beam of acoustic pulse. Okay. Now look into one thing as we were entering into the Fraunhofer zone which is my far field my points were aligned along a straight line on the beam whereas when I was in the Fresnel zone they keep on uh, changing their location. So this is sort of not in a long range correlation over here henceforth if I go this beam will keep on being a straight line whereas over here they have different points where they are going to interfere with each other okay. and that is the reason why in near field we do not do an imaging because you do not have a very concentrated beam formation happening in the near field although amplitude of the energy signal is much higher over there. So why that is higher eventually come down in material properties and we will discuss that as the wave keeps on propagating with media there is some sort of a loss in its energy as well. So that we have ways of compensating for that as well. But for the time being remember that we do the imaging in the Fraunhofer zone or the far field only for the reason that you have a very distinct beam formation happening over there. Okay. Now from here that we know that beam forming happens only due to interference we are going to enter into this whole concept of beam forming or what do you do on the instrumentation side so that you can actually form a perfect beam over there. Now for that what we do is something of this sort. So say you have the surface and two transducers present over there right and uh, you have your uh, reflector over here. Now say that you th this you had already formed the beam during forward transmission which is your acoustic beam was already sent okay. and now this point was located on your acoustic beam and this starts sending out. So now your transducer are behaving in a receiver mode no more in a transmitter mode over there. Okay. But when it is behaving in a receiver mode it still will have a way that the same beam will reach one of uh, like both the transducers but with some sort of a delay now look over here. So if we look into uh, time versus amplitude plot of the signal received by both the transducers now T1 and T2 and try to plot it down. So this is how the wave front is going to propagate and now if you see that the wave front first hits T1 and that is why you get one pulse over here at T1 and after some time after a time delay it hits this second transducer which is T2 
So, you have this delay over there. Now, somehow we need to keep in mind that by looking at these time delays of subsequent ones coming down at say if there is T 3, T 4 eventually. So, there would be subsequent delays over there, whereas if there is another uh, uh, transducer over here which is called as T 0, then that would be preceding T 1 as well in the pulse arrival over there. So, looking at all of them together there should be a way in which we can estimate in the 2D space where this particular point is located. So, our earlier problem which we had solved is what is the distance from the transducer along the line which is orthogonal to the transducer's plane. Okay. Now, the point is if we want to look into this particular direction then we can use this uh, information about how much delayed it is between arriving at different transducers in order to find out where it is located in space. Now, if say this point uh, this particular reflector is located exactly between these two transducers then both the waves will strike both the transducers at the same point of time this is what will happen. Now, let us derive a mathematical model because this is guided down by pure geometric model which is a very very straightforward way of finding out and that is why the instrumentation is not so complicated in any way. Now, say that uh, I have an array of transducers which is over here okay. and this is the centroid of that uh, center of the transducer. So, from here any particular uh, transducer is at a distance of x i. So, my i th transducer is at a distance of x i and say this is the point which is reflecting my beam now. Okay. So, the distance from the center of the transducer to this point is called as r f p okay. and the distance of this point to this i th transducer is called as d i. Okay. This axis is x axis. So, which is along the uh, length of the transducer array over there and the direction which is orthogonal to the length of the transducer array is called as the z axis over there. Now, with this kind of a setting we would get that the time taken for a pulse to start from here and arrive over here is equal to T i. So, a pulse which starts over here and strikes back at the transducer i th transducer which is at a distance of x i from here is given by this equation. So, you can just solve this standard geometry and you will also be getting down the same sort of an equation coming down over here. Now, look into one particular point that the distance from the transducer of this particular point is a constant factor that does not change with the elements of the transducer. The inter elemental spacing between the transducers is also constant that is why you can you actually know what is the distance between the center point and every single i th transducer which is also constant. The only point is that uh, if if the c which is also the sound of uh, the speed of sound in that particular media is also known to you then you can always solve this one out. And now you will know that from a particular point in space if I have a reflection then at what time intervals it is going to reach which particular transducer over there. Now, from there we need to have another estimate which is called as the maximum time taken down to for this uh, wave to reach down from the first transducer to the end transducer which is the total scanning duration which we need to take care of. So, if I am looking if I am scanning for a larger interval of time what would happen is let us say there is a point over here and that. So, by the time I finish scanning this one the beam from this one also strikes this one. So, that is going to create some sort of a ambiguity between the two points which I can discriminate and this factor as such is very much important in order to decide the spatial resolution of your imaging instrument. So, from here x max is basically the maximum distance to be covered over there since that is also known for a definite transducer geometry. So, you can always find out what is my T max and this T max inverse of this T max is my uh, pulse sequence repetition time which will give me that for like after this amount of time I should be give sending my next pulse and wait for the next object to come down uh, on being imaged. So, together if we look into this whole uh, concept over here and try to even reduce it in terms of this theta because that makes it even an easier job is now you do not need to know what is this d i and what is this x i and everything, but you just say what is the radial distance between the point I am trying to look from my transducer center and what is the angle at which this particular thing is located. So, now you have a way in which you can actually do a sweep in the angular direction and find out different points located along that sweeping array over there. Okay. Now, this is the way in which imaging is carried down since we are not a 
class on uh, details of imaging instrumentation. So, we cannot go much beyond this except for understanding that it is basically over time if you can discriminate it out then you are able to create down in space where the objects are located and that is the basic principle of ultrasound imaging. So, this is a basic block diagram of what an ultrasound uh, imaging instrument looks like. So, over here we have the transducer. Okay. Now, if you look at the transducer there is a multiplexer over here which has a transmit buffer and there is a receive buffer two sides of it. Okay. Now, what this multiplexer does is that uh, it basically switches whether you are sending a transmission beam or a receiver beam and then if, if you are in the receiver mode you do not switch on the transmitter there is in that case what would happen is that you are going to put this whole high voltage transmission into the receiver side and just fill up fry up this whole circuit over there. So, this is just to stop this one and over here we have the rear end or the back end over where you have rest of the post processing going on. So, basically all transducers and all these readings over there are captured and sent over here. So, in this part it tries to find out what is the difference between the repetition sequences coming down at multiple uh, transducers and from there interpolates into where in space is my actual abnormality located or, or the actual reflector of ultrasound located over there which is pretty much which sums up the total principle of an ultrasound imaging system. So, some important things from perspective of understanding medical image analysis is to understand the speed of sound and properties. Now, one thing is that uh, everybody of us know about the speed of sound in air is 330 meters per second. Okay. But as you keep on going into denser media your speed of sound actually increases in water it is 1492 meters per second in adipose tissue or what is commonly known as uh, body fat. So, something beneath your uh, uh, skin which keeps you warm is that part which is called as adipose tissue. The speed of sound is 1470 meters per second which is very close to water actually it is just 22 meters per second of a difference over there which is sort of negligible. On your liver you have a much higher speed of sound and as you keep on going you would see that in compact bone it is the highest 3600 meters per second. And this again concurs to our understanding that in solids the speed of sound is highest and in gaseous media the speed of sound is lowest. Okay. So, from there uh, analogous to the refractive index which we have for light we also have an acoustic index and an acoustic impedance for different materials as well and this is a list of the different acoustic impedances. And if you look carefully over here the acoustic impedance of air is much lower than all of them which have acoustic impedance in the order of 10 power 6 and that is the reason why if you sh like speak in air basically multiple people can hear over longer distances whereas over here since the acoustic impedance is much higher so it will die much faster. So, this is the reason why your depth of ultrasonic imaging is very much limited you cannot just go for an infinite depth of ultrasound imaging over there you have a very finite depth because after some time you are just going to lose down all viable amplitude and will just be getting down a lot of noise coming to this. Okay. Um, so, now another factor which you will have to look is uh, this half value layer. So, what this half value layer means basically is when you are emitting a pulse from the transducer uh, it has a certain power. So, the power decreases to half of it at what distance. So, this is similar to a half power distance or half power bandwidth you have for electromagnetic systems as well. Now, if you look at it the adipose tissue has the highest distance of this half power uh, uh, distance half, uh, half value layer. Now, for this reason if you are imaging fat then you can image to a much larger distance without having much effective noise whereas, you would see that uh, in uh, muscle this is the lowest uh, is it, it is quite low and in compact bone it is the lowest. And so, ultrasound imaging of bone is practically not possible. So, if you are trying to image down bone you would get a very distinct shadow after just touching the surface of the bone because most of it just gets absorbed very drastically in front of the bone. Now, let us get into what happens with this. Uh, so, now that we had understood about all of those uh, different properties and some numbers for different tissues and how it works out I want to show you one of these images. So, over here you would see that this part is uh, this top part is the skin and then you have some adipose tissue and over here muscle fibers and then there is a bone. And now, look interestingly over here you did not have uh, any bone structure present that is why you could go to a depth over here somewhere and you still have very viable speckles coming down from here. 
now when the moment you hit the bone after that you basically have a complete shadowing so you don't get any more reflections back from there and that's called as a perfect acoustic shadowing over there so this is in effect what happens when you look on the image which is a property of all the objects which you were uh, trying to image over there so they they are very characteristic attributes of uh, tissue properties themselves now uh, we define something called as the material transfer function uh, while the wave propagates through an ultrasound and this is the relation between them so what this says is that say p not of f which is the power of ultrasound uh, at a particular frequency so this is very much dependent on the frequency of the transducer you are using when it is being activated if that is p not uh, and say at a distance z so along this length is z which we had seen okay so along this length at a particular point which is at a distance of z what is the total power received and that is a product of this one multiplied by this multi uh, material transfer function though this material transfer function has two uh, attributes over there the frequency and the z direction together now that gets defined something like this that this mtf is basically an e power of uh, the factor gamma f times of the distance from the transducer and gamma f is again uh, a complex quantity which is minus alpha f times uh, minus alpha f minus uh, i times imaginary times beta f and alpha f is again dependent on a constant factor alpha naught which is a property of this uh, mass of tissue over where it is going so different tissues have different types of alpha naughts over there and alpha 1 which is also dependent over here and alpha 1 uh, times of frequency raised to the power of y this is what it uh, signifies over there now as you see that if we have a if we look through this whole cumulative set of equations along with alpha and beta you would see one particular thing that at the same depth if you have a higher frequency you have a light larger attenuation right so it is definitely always uh, very profitable to run at a lower frequency right but is that always a very good idea is the question I mean if that is so then let us run it if, if I just want to use the best of the ultrasound frequency let me use uh, 21000 hertz or 21 kilohertz the first ultrasound frequency over there but when you go for actual imaging you would see that most of them run into something of megahertz and that is where I will come down to this clinical use tally now look over here that ultrasound frequency of 3 megahertz this has a maximum depth up to 150 millimeters obviously uh, if you go to greater than 20 megahertz you have less than even 25 millimeters over there or 2.5 centimeters so it is very beneficial to use a 3 megahertz in one way now the question comes down in the aspect of resolution which is axial resolution if you look at it if you have a lower frequency obviously you have a larger wavelength so your axial resolution is also going to be lower over there so your ability to discriminate two neighboring objects along the z direction at a lower frequency is much lower then you have at a higher frequency and that is why if we are looking at a larger depth you have a lower resolution if you are looking at a smaller depth you have a much higher resolution and you compensate with the ultrasound frequencies as well so if you are using a 3 megahertz probe you would try to look at a larger depth rather than a higher resolution in a smaller depth because you will never be getting a higher resolution in any way the other factor is obviously on the lateral resolution as well because that also impacts which is along the length of the transducer how much was the resolution you were achieving and that is also again dependent on the frequencies and as you see that if we increase frequencies obviously your depth decreases maximum depth of imaging but your resolution as well increases and based on that we basically have different organs which can be imaged with different frequencies of transducers and this is what clinicians refer to as a standard tally so 3 megahertz is for general purpose or fetal ultrasound heart and liver ultrasound whereas 5 megahertz is for kidney uh, heart and brain and that is again looking at what is the depth and what is the resolution I would need for looking into my pathological structures over there so from there two frequencies of 20 or greater than that are more most for research applications and for vascular and skin applications so there are particular imaging modalities called as intravascular ultrasound where you use frequencies higher than 20 megahertz something like 40 megahertz or 63 megahertz which offer a much higher resolution but for a very smaller depth because depths of arteries or the thickness of artery is much smaller actually so let us enter into a very practical device so this is what 
if you are there at a clinic you would be look, looking at an ultrasound and this is what it appears like. So this is where the clinician sees all of this, this is a standard keyboard for entering the data of the patient over there, these are three different probes and these are some of these controls and uh, on including on this touch screen which uh, basically control where the pers person wants to focus and what are the different types of frequencies they are selecting for each of these probes and multiple of these uh, control parameters which are available over there. Now typically with a linear probe which looks something like this you would be getting an image of this sort. So keep one thing in mind that here since it is linear so all the waves are going exactly. So the beams, the waves are not going orthogonal to it but the beam formation is always orthogonal over here. So you would get down a perfectly linearly looking image coming down over here and these are more of used for uh, like imaging of uh, say the carotid artery and similar very close to surface vascular structures. The other one is a curvilinear probe which is very common for abdominal imaging and for imaging of the liver uh, and, and on this uh, curvilinear probe what happens is since the surface is curved you can actually make out that the beam which goes orthogonal to the surface points will also be spanning out over a region over there and it, it forms a very curved region. Now the other kind of a probe is called as a sectoral probe which is uh, very much useful for uh, cardiac imaging and what happens is the probe is very small over here and, and again it has a geometry which is almost like a curvilinear probe but even with a much wider span than a curvilinear probe over there. And since the size is very small what it helps is if you are trying to do cardiac imaging you will you have your ribs over here and you will have to look in between the ribs. So now this probe's dimension is much smaller so that you can actually place it in between two ribs and you do not get enough of. Uh, acoustic impedance coming due to the bones of the ribs and you can look through all the structures present inside over there. So these are some of the commonly used probes uh, uh, which clinicians use and most of the data and images you would see are from these kind of probes over there. Now for much more detailed reading you can actually have a look through this particular white paper from Texas Instruments which dis discusses the whole signal processing overview of ultrasound systems. And uh, as well you can look into chapter 6 of this particular textbook uh, on medical imaging technology which discusses about the actual instrumentation, the clinical attributes and different uh, properties of ultrasound in total. So with that we come to an end to ultrasound imaging and thank you. Okay, so today uh, I am going to show you basically a demonstration of one of those practical ultrasound machines and uh, you have already seen uh, something similar to this particular image on the presentation which we were doing for ultrasound imaging. Now uh, to give you a closer look you have a keypad over here which is a quite a generic keypad and the purpose of this one is to enter all textual uh, information which is related to the patient. So I can just click over here and start up a patient session and uh, if uh, I want to create so I will just go over there uh, and create a new patient and enter all of them and then click on OK and then the patient information gets saved over there. Now for as for the rest of the things you would see that uh, there are three probes over here which uh, we are going to use and they are pretty similar to the ones which you have seen on the presentation as well. So the first probe which I have is a linear probe, now if you look carefully over here there is a marker and this particular marking is basically my left reference or, or the reference similar to what you see over here as a circle. Now on, on the screen if you see this particular circle is always aligned onto which side I am holding my particular probe over here. So since it is on the left so I am supposed to hold my probe on the left so that I have a perfect anatomical reference otherwise if I just flip it down then it will be a reflected one coming down over there. So there is also a way of basically changing it out so there are options of basically reflecting out. Uh, the same probe over there without much of an issue. Now one uh, particular interesting thing I would like to show you is uh, the number over here for this probe. So this is L123 which means this is a linear probe of 12 megahertz and this 3 is basically a number which specifies the generation uh, of iteration of this particular probe which was under development. The second probe which I would be showing you is a curvilinear probe, this is a C52. So this is a curvilinear probe at 5 megahertz and the second generation of that particular probe and you have a similar uh, notch over here which signifies the left side of it and it is quite an ergonomically designed one so that you can hold it very uh, rigidly in your hand. Now 
the other probe which we had seen was a sectoral probe for cardiac imaging. So, this was a S42 and uh, this is a sectoral at 4 megahertz and the second generation of that particular uh, uh, probe over here. Now, uh, some other controls which you can see up on this particular control panel over here. The first one is called as a time gain compensation. Now, since ultrasound as it propagates, we have looked through those equations and the uh, total derivation as to how the energy actually attenuates as it goes uh, to a deeper tissue. Now, for that particular reason, you will have to amplify signals coming back from much deeper down, then you have to amplify the signals. So, basically, you need to attenuate signals which are very close to you and sort of amplify signals very far off from you. So, if you look at that screen over there. Um, you can uh, see that as I keep on changing these uh, parameters, there is a gain factor which is changing shown as a curve over there. Now, uh, this is uh, generally we do not make any changes onto this one other than the uh, radiologist who has a very subjective jurisdiction onto making these changes over here because uh, the machine is pre calibrated and systems are preset over there as to how to use it. The other one which I would show you is called as LGC or lateral gain compensation. Now, this is something which compensates the left right kind of a loss over there. So, say that I want to amplify the signals which are coming from the left hand side and I want to attenuate signals coming from the right hand side. So, I can basically make those changes over here. In general, we keep them as unity amplification of both sides and only in very specific cases that we uh, use very selective amplifications coming down over there. Now, uh, without uh, taking much of a time, uh, what I would try to show is. Uh, one of these probes and how we are doing. So, we have our volunteer over here Devargo who is uh, interestingly doing his uh, PhD also on ultrasound and today we are going to perform an ultrasound on him. So, he has volunteered to have his carotid um, uh, imaged. Now, you can see as I put, put up this uh, gel which is basically just an uh, conductive uh, sonologically conductive gel. So, this is uh, nothing other than some gelatin and water and uh, some preservatives mixed together and it is perfectly non toxic for external use uh, although like it is never suggested that you still try eating it because it is not an edible product as such. Now, as I put this one you would see that uh, there are speckles which become very stationary over there on the screen which were earlier not appearing before I put down this jelly and the reason for them is that the sound which is coming up from uh, the probe it is passing through this uh, uh, jelly over here and then trying to come out, but on the top it is basically air which is much rarer in acoustic density than the gel itself and that is causing a lot of reflection. So, these are basically uh, subsequent uh, stationary reflections which are going down uh, within the jelly itself and that is causing uh, those kind of stationary speckles appearing on the screen. So, let us try to put them into a actual clinical use. Uh, so, let us look into Devargo's carotid artery. Now, if you see over here, you would see a beating structure. So, this particular structure over here is the carotid artery. Now, let me actually try to uh, uh, zoom over there. So, what I would do is basically I reduce my depth of scan so that you can see a much better view over here. So, as I reduce my depth of scan you can see it now I would try to change my focal zone as well, but uh, somehow it does not allow me to go any more deeper in focus. So, this is the carotid artery which is beating over there. Now, interestingly you see that the speckles are really large over here it is it is uh, in the order of uh, like a few speckle uh, like few tens of speckles that the whole carotid artery would be seen. Now, let us uh, actually freeze this one. So, what I would do is I would put it on a dual monitor. So, you can see this is one of those frozen views from this uh, sectoral probe and uh, this side is my dynamic view. Now, we have some uh, basic uh, system settings which we can change over here. So, I can change my map over here. This is a grayscale intensity mapping function which maps non-linearly maps uh, intensities uh, received ultrasound decodes to intensities. Uh, smoothing is something uh, which is uh, frame averaging which is good for actually reducing the uh, total speckle heterogeneity over there, but you eventually end up losing a lot of information. Persist is a moving window average kind of thing. So, if you have a larger persist then it will keep on uh, having lesser speckles, but again you compensate on them and this LR invert is what is inverting my reference. So, if my reference is like this and I want to invert it out then I can use my LR invert over there to uh, have the same thing and similarly you see uh, there is an up down invert option over here. 
so this will do a vertical flipping of my image as well now let us move from uh, one of these probes so as I finish off I am going to wipe off the probe as a standard practice and precautionary measure and uh, next I am going to use this curvilinear probe now for that I will have to do a hard switch within the system because uh, all my driver circuits over there my amplifiers my power drivers everything will have to physically switch over to another probe which is electrically connected over there so I have my switch over here which is called as probe this is a probe flipping switch so I switch over to that probe next probe over there and if you carefully look at this probe this is called a C52 and uh, let us look over here on the screen you would also see the same probe so this means that this particular probe is already selected so it is my curvilinear probe which is selected now now I put down some jelly on my curvilinear probe okay and now let us try to image down the carotid artery over there so as I see I need to go down at a higher depth and possibly increase my gain factor as well and now I can see his carotid artery meeting over here okay so I can zoom into that as well so if you see it together you would see that uh, uh, one interesting fact is that you we did achieve a higher resolution when we were looking into through this probe and that was because this is at a 5 megahertz uh, rather than the other one which we are using at a 4 megahertz over there so let me just keep this one back and uh, the final one which is actually the one which we are actually supposed to use for uh, imaging of carotid which is the linear probe which is going to give you the best resolution coming down over there so I again do my probe shift operation and then you see it is a L123 which is corresponding to this particular linear probe over here and then as I put the probe so let us just do a bit of scanning through and I increase the gain I will have to change my mapping functions as well so here is the carotid artery which I see on the linear probe okay now let us zoom into that so one of these interesting things is you will see beyond the carotid artery this is where the artery is and the blood is flowing you see this enhanced region the speckles are much more brighter and that is called as the enhancement there will be a rim of shadows coming down over there which is clinically relevant and uh, so uh, one uh, let us just freeze this one yeah so I have just frozen it out <coughs> so that is acquired the frame and just kept it over there now if you look into uh, the linear probe and compare it compare the one with the sectoral probe on the right hand side uh, on those two images over there something interesting is that there are much more denser speckles over here than over here so the speckle sizes are much smaller so your resolution is obviously much higher you will get down uh, almost uh, three times higher resolution with the 12 megahertz probe than you would be getting down with a 4 megahertz probe that is that is some intuitive thing which you can do over here and uh, so and since these were some of the intuitive examples which I can show down for uh, our example um, and all of the images which you will be having will be something of these similar sorts uh, uh, for processing and the challenge is definitely in the presence of so dense noise over there and uncertainties how to do it and uh, subsequent lectures we will be uh, covering a lot of these techniques as to how to specifically deal with speckles and whether speckles are seriously noisy and uh, nuisance rather than something useful and, and we will have a case study where we will make use of this uh, actual statistical nature of speckles as well so with that uh, thank you